Welcome to the summer series, talking all about uh, blended learning and the move to blended learning uh, today. I can't see the participants uh, list, so if you do have a question that's urgent during the um, session, maybe if you just uh, chat to Peter Green, who's also joining us today. Uh, it's a kind of joint presentation, and he can raise the question, or if you want to raise the question, that's great. So uh, just some housekeeping, if everybody could keep their microphone on mute. Um, the session is report recorded, so please um, switch off your video cameras if you don't want to be. Um, questions if you want to use the chat function on Zoom. So what do we mean by, by blended learning then? So um, let's just go through. Let's start by defining a few particular terms that we might have. Um, so distance learning, for example, distance learning we can see here. Um, you know, we have a, we're not all face to face in the University of Manchester, we're distributed around the country. And obviously another term on that is kind of transnational learning, which just means outside of kind of geographical borders. So all over the world, which is what will be happening for semester one for a lot of our students who may not opt to come um, to Manchester and, and, and be on campus. So there's also online learning. So what we mean by online learning is obviously we're doing this through uh, a laptop. Um, and, and we have our materials online for our students to engage with. Let's keep going. So traditionally what's happened is the traditional model is we have some kind of lecture where our students come see us face to face um, and then there's some kind of homework or um, post lecture reading and, and an alternative for that that many colleagues in the faculty, faculty utilize is uh, this idea of the flipped learning. So actually what we do now is we provide our materials beforehand whether that's reading or, or videos and then afterwards in the actual kind of face-to-face -face lecture slot there's more of a kind of practical activity and reinforcement of that learning so it's not so much delivering particular materials to people but reinforcing those and doing exercises and the advantage of this method of, uh, of teaching is that uh, our students can engage with the materials beforehand and then and ask questions where they know that they don't understand so it has some advantages so what do we mean by blended learning so blended learning is an approach to education that combines online educational materials and opportunities for interaction online with traditional place-based classroom methods. And it requires the physical presence of both the teacher and the students with some elements of the student control over time, place, path and, and pace. Um, in terms of the value of blended learning, so that there's quite a few kind of quite a lot. There's a big systematic review of the literature, which pretty much shows that uh, it has is either as good or has advantages over face to face learning. So it can be a real, a real benefit if we invest our time in it now to develop the materials for the future years. So let's look at some so in a little bit more detail. So what do we mean by some key concepts of synchronous? So what we mean by synchronous, we're going to use in the rest of this kind of presentation, uh, is what uh, students and lecturers are present at the same time and activities happen live. So this is the online face-to-face um, -face stuff, just like we're doing now. This is a synchronous activity. I'm in the same place, uh, well, not the same place, but at the same time currently where we're delivering this and you're here to listen and we're going to have a discussion after this. And then there's the asynchronous. So that's the lectures we create or curate our materials that the students access at their own pace which has advantages that they can pause videos, recap concepts, which they don't understand before they move on. Let's also look at something we haven't discussed so far, is what's common across synchronous and asynchronous activities. And there's some really important concepts to, to come over here. And, and that's about motivating our students. Within both synchronous and asynchronous activities, we want to show them something surprising or unusual, or show how what we're doing is valuable to them, to motivate them to engage with the materials. We also need to orientate our students. One thing that we know about blended learning is it's harder to describe expectations under the timetable and, and, so, uh, and reinforce that structure for students' learning. About priming our students, so reminding them what they're already, they already know before doing an activity. So an example of this might be they're doing um, you know, a, a, new, a new analysis of something, so reminding them of some key concepts that are gonna be vital for that analysis. Uh, modeling so this is uh, where you you know you might introduce a new do a derivation introduce a new concept and then you would model you do an, uh, an example with the students before you'd ask them to go and do an example themselves so they see that concept or method being applied in one way before they go and do it themselves and then finally feedback which is obviously really important um, which can be synchronous or asynchronous 
to show the students how do they do the task properly before they do it. Okay, I should have added my words there. Um, let's have a look. So asynchronous then, let's look a little bit more at this. Asynchronous then, so explain, teach. So this is kind of videos. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be videos that we create ourselves. There may be some excellent resources out there that we want to point our students to. It might also be reading. You might want to provide PDFs or papers or, or items or slides and ask students to, to read those. And um, that's mainly explaining and teaching. Um, um, for the kind of um, asynchronous practice interact test, which we should also be encouraging our students to do, some examples. So please, any questions? Yeah, so, so we've got a, a point made by Wu uh, Yang Yang uh, about not using YouTube because students can't see it in China. Um, absolutely, you, 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 yes, if you sent them a link to a YouTube video, they certainly wouldn't be able to see it. Some YouTube providers, because um, I've got a colleague doing this, depending on the licensing arrangements, do seem quite happy to share the video material, particularly some educational material that you could then embed into our own video sources that can be shared. You're absolutely right, Ruliang, you can't just send uh, a YouTube video link. So um, we've got a question from Yuli here. So what kind of reporting will there be for video editing transcribing? Um, I'm not, what kind of support? Okay, so certainly for video editing. So, so we're just in the process now of um, finalizing which software we're, we're gonna recommend for, for uh, PC, Mac and, and Linux. So for Mac, it's gonna look like we're gonna be recommending um, the existing QuickTime features and iMovie for editing and the training resources I'd hope to land maybe towards the end of this week, early next week. Um, for PC uh, editing, I think it's OpenShot that we're looking at and for recording, it's gonna be Loom and Loom can also be used as a plugin within uh, Google Chrome as well for, for Linux users. Um, would the slides be available for each session? Certainly from the slides from this, I think, are available, Andy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, we can we can put those up. Certainly it's probably quite important as there's lots of useful links up there. So yeah, we can we can facilitate that. Also to say that so we're now running these weekly uh, blended learning question times for want of a better thing, stolen from Gardner's question time. Uh, the last one was excellent. I thought it was some really good discussion. So the recordings from those are going on StaffNet and a transcription of the answers to questions, not just from us, from everyone, are going on to our wiki. So we'll be circulating that link as soon as we've kept up with the typing. Good, so I can see another question here, Peter. So why 10 minute videos? Many of us will use previous podcasts and concentrate on other support materials. So if you look at the guidance document, we're, we're definitely not recommending kind of taking whole lots of podcasts and, and reusing those online. So trying to chunk things down and, and chunking things down because that's what the literature said is, is good practice and aids our students learning. But also, uh, you know, we should be mindful of our students' experience here and what our students are gonna think. Um, we've already seen in, in, in the emergency move to um, online teaching, a petition was launched from the University of uh, Liverpool by some students which had 330 students um, sign up to it, which went to MPs uh, around refunds for funds and uh, for, for fees. Um, there's been some more guidance uh, released today from the OIA. So we really need to be careful and clear that we're, we are uh, doing our best for our students and following that good practice. I mean, just to say on that, there could be things, Simon, from previous podcasts which you think are particularly useful. Uh, a colleague last week was just extracting out a 10 minute piece of derivation they did on a visualizer, which as they said, they'd probably struggle to do it any better now. So I think absolutely extract bits from it. Andy, I see we've got a, uh, Paul's asking if we can drop the links from the slides into the chat. Yeah, I will, that I, yeah that's great. If you, if you pick up on the questions, Peter, then I, can, I can't do two oh, things at once. So that would be... That's a fair, that's a fair trade. Uh, okay, just looking at what Kate Smith said. Is there a recommended software to do the subtitling? Yes, yeah, so the university is looking at subtitling at the moment. We have a, uh, well, a subscription, I believe, through Google that does it for podcast material that gets uploaded to the main university website. We've run into a few difficulties that with some of the technical subjects, which many of us lecture, particularly mathematical, it does struggle. 
So we're looking to see if we can get some resource from the Institute of Teaching and Learning, which would probably be student interns to help us with some of the more technical subtitling. We're also looking at other pieces of software as well, but I have a sneaking feeling this is going to be far better done by humans than software for some of our subjects. Uh, keeping going, Lee, uh, Persuade IT to set up a 2021 Blackboard space as early as possible. Yep, I think e-learning will actually be doing this. So I think the plan, and Andy can put me right if I'm wrong, is the spaces will be created nominally as blank spaces with some template information, but that you will have ready access to everything from last session. So colleagues who've already got a wealth of material that they really don't want to have to recreate will literally be able to drag it across into the current template. But because of quite a few issues last year with the units, we're proposing we will start from blank, but you can drag and drop from last year. I think that's probably a couple of weeks away. And did you think with um, what Dan Jagger was saying? Yeah, I think from what he was saying, I think we were we were looking um, a couple of weeks away. Yeah, yeah, not too long. So just see, you you've dropped the links in. Thanks, Andy. I'm just scanning forward now. Uh, uh, but, but, um, so I'm just reading what Dave Lester's written. I find videos. Um, yep. So we were talking about this this morning, Dave Lester's comment about whether we could provide transcripts rather than videos as a method of taking on board the material. So I think we're going to try and do that with a few of the videos, aren't we, Andy? We're going to see if we can get a fairly quick transcript out as a PDF and then a set of slides that you could work with. Yep. No, a couple of people have asked that. Though. Um, Peter, just to just oh, yeah. click on here. I wasn't actually thinking in terms of um, sort of slide uh, material being uh, done. The typical way I've written lectures in the past has actually been to write a uh, proper uh, PDF type book. I mean, it's not quite the full book because it hasn't got enough examples in it, but it's, it's bloody close. Um, and I, the feedback I get from the kids is that actually that that is very useful. It's a it's a much more verbose form than mm -hmm. the um than, than the slides. Uh, and uh, speaking personally, I, I do find the podcast delivery that you're giving on how to do blended learning uh, deeply frustrating because I just want to dive in and, and pick the salient points for me. Um, and, and and that's that's really where, where this one started. And I just wondered whether um, this too counts as blended learning. I figure it probably does. I think it does, and I think it's a bit falls into Andy's category that he put up of reading material. It doesn't have to be a video. And I think it does vary discipline to discipline. Um, I can imagine that working in some disciplines, clearly yours, David, in computer science, but there's other disciplines where the students are quite have really spoken very vocally in support of video material. So I think any and all, Absolutely. to be honest, but having an entirety of text may be tough for some students. So. Uh, as appropriate. But I do also take your point that sometimes I find watching a video, particularly if you know some of the material, could, could be a bit frustrating. Um, yeah, Peter, just, to, just to add to that, I'd, I'd agree, yeah. I would agree with that. I think, I think if it, you, you know, a bit of variety is great for our students, but I, I don't see something problematic as, as providing some reading materials for students to engage with, and then there's a worked video example or something like that. Absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Um, Patrick, hi there. Um, yep, I think that that is quite a, a modest uh, estimate of actually one day to produce, if you like, to turn a standard lecture into blended learning. I think I, I am certainly not at that speed myself at the moment. I've been trying to do it with some of my semester two material. Uh, I expect I hope to get to that point. But yes, it is it is a significant ask that's being made in terms of effort to do this and best not to underestimate. I see we've got a question about the equipment link. So yeah, so this this is um, what we've done is we, we've bought this. We, we're concerned about the, the supply of equipment in the UK as other universities and schools all try to buy the same equipment, visualizers, microphones and stuff. So we, we bought, bought a load of this and that's what the question is about. So this is to support you to develop your blended learning materials from home, yes. Yep. Um, and obviously we've got to then pull off the bit of magic of turning a bulk order which will come to the university and getting it out to people. So we're looking at how best to do that uh, or how efficiently to do that as well. Um, 
if anybody hasn't seen that link yet, do let us know. It should have now gone out in all disciplines. Uh, we had to jump the gun slightly and get an order out there because just the, I think within the first few days of even trying to come up with a shopping list, we watched that shopping list go out of stock because obviously we're not the only institute that's trying to bulk buy in this space. So uh, we took a bit of a, a flyer on what it was. Then we've got out the request to you. I'm under no illusion. I suspect we'll have to go back to the Dean and there'll have to be additional purchase. We'll need more of these items. So I can see we've got one from Osgun um, about state of the art and on current uh, online learning and what that is. So, um, so yes, uh, the, the, I posted in the in the the links, the chat feature, a link to the our blenders um, kind of uh, course about how to plan a unit, about what would be would be good practice, and and we've also had some feedback about the videos. You know, Steve Pettifer and James. Brooks and, and Dan Jagger and others from e-learning uh, are very, very good at this. It, we realised that this, we're not all, I'm not sure I could achieve that standard to be perfectly honest with you. What we want to do, and, and, and we shouldn't all be aiming for that, we're not going to be all globally leading people at putting together blended learning materials, but what we do want to do is reach a good standard. Um, so I say engage with that course, you know, what, watch the videos that I hope, hope are helpful. Uh, and let's try and meet those those kind of the guidance around standards about what we 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 are saying to our students that this is what we want to achieve. Just look at so Mustafa's asking about the blenders question times. Yeah, they come down via B line, but I think we could probably post the links to them on the um, teaching academy website. Andrew, do you think as a as a way of just yeah, so people don't have to find I'll, I'll get that. Yep, yeah, get that actually. Now, but, they will be landing always at the same time on a Thursday, but you're right, we need the Zoom link to them. I was really pleased. I mean, it's a really good debate, the last one. Uh, yeah, Blackboard, Simon. Um, yeah, it doesn't integrate well into a person's everyday life. That's one way of putting it. Um, it's not ideal. Uh, the advantage we have with it is it is a known platform, certainly for going into China with. So we, we know where we stand with it in terms of the reach to students. Uh, the university is looking at other delivery platforms. Uh, we are beginning to look a little bit, there's a small group of us testing Microsoft Teams at the moment for delivering some material. Other colleagues have been trying to push Zoom harder. I think we're going to be with Blackboard for a little bit while longer, um, but I, do, I can't disagree with your comment. It doesn't necessarily integrate well. Uh, access to software. Yeah, so this is Matt Roy's question. So over summer, IT services have given student, registered students remote access to our PC clusters. Um, there is currently a piece of work to see if we can extend that into semester one so that that specialist software is remotely accessible still. Concerns with it are scalability. It's not, it, they, they did a great thing. They turned around in three weeks, a very quick, and they say dirty interface to let our students use it. It is working, it's doing its job. They're just a bit worried about what happens when we upscale to all students semester one. But we are actually looking at that. We're also trying to renegotiate licenses. So many of you may have seen, we've renegotiated the MATLAB license now. So students can have that on their own devices for the next academic year, around to 30th of September 21. That's the preferred solution where we can do it because it's certainly gonna give a more robust um, solution we're also looking at virtual desktop as well so using cloud computing uh, we'll know more about remote access semester one in about two weeks time scanning down the questions can you post components Wuliang? so William, I'll get you to get in touch with our colleague, Niels Wallet, who was leading the practical teaching group, because I think they've been looking at um, where we can post electronic components to. There may be some restrictions based on the country that could be slightly problematic. Um, most of Europe, not a problem. Uh, China, ironically, I think we're sending them back to them based on where we ordered them from. Uh, but I think we just need to be careful. There may be a few countries where that's tricky. So Niels is pulling that piece together. 
I could just pick up on Osgun's point. He, he's, he's replied to the to our reply, um, saying, um, "Thank you for the answer. I watched the videos. They were, but uh, I mean, lots of people aren't aware that the MIT, OC, edX, and Coursera gives high quality lectures, free or cheap, so students will compare lectures with them." Um, yes, I, I I I agree with you. Um, you know, there are these fantastic resources out there. Um, but I, I do think we, we have to be realistic about what it is that we can achieve. And, and providing that we are um, providing that we are being clear with our students, and I think working in partnership with our students and asking them for feedback, and we're focusing on the community elements of the learning, uh, giving them the opportunities, hopefully with some face-to-face -face labs, then, then I think that's as good as we're going to get. I don't, I don't think we're going to all become globally... Um, you know, really super polished um, at the blended learning materials. Um, we need to meet a particular standard, uh, and uh, you know, if we do that, I think we'll we'll be okay. Um, interestingly, some of the feedback that I've seen from from our students on this is actually the kind of corporate super polished type of materials doesn't always go down uh, really well. Sometimes they like something that's a bit more rough and realistic and. And personable maybe so 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 i think it's achievable where we're aiming to get to yeah just to reinforce that point I, th I think you know we'd be fools to think we're going to literally in the matter of six months suddenly be a world leader on that stage i think we've got to keep sight of the other aspects that make why you want to come to manchester we're going to have to prioritize labs just to mention labs in a social distancing mode just not going to be able to run our labs at anything near the capacity we do uh, in a normal year. And so we're going to have to prioritise which labs are most important for students to do. And I think those will probably focus on the graduating years, particularly where they deliver programme level learning outcomes. Uh, it would be lovely to think that we do at least try and give every year group some exposure to laboratory activities. There will be other things we can run on campus in small groups or academic advising, but again, we're going to be very hard pushed on the capacity of the estate. Because what, if you want two metres social separation, it really pushes the capacity of most of our rooms down significantly below what people were originally envisaging. Estates are doing a bit of a modelling exercise at the moment uh, on our timetabling requests, but um, I think it's going to be a lot less than we first thought. I'm just scanning back up the questions. I think we've got a question from Alika, um, Peter. So can we use demonstrators as help for our synchronous part of our lectures to help us with technical aspects? Um, yes is the answer to this. I think, you know, uh, a, a GTA uh, in a face-to-face -face can, can do the same similar type of activities online. Jennifer Slaughter, who's our, our faculty lead for, for GTAs, is already looking at particular training needs and how they will changed to, to kind of cope with COVID-19 and a, a blended approach and we're putting some training in there so uh, I, I would envisage that we you know in fact the guidance document said we should be running two um, small group sessions within each of our units um, so we, we are going to need GTAs to do those and, and support of other colleagues uh, PDRAs if, if possible to support delivery of those otherwise it will mean um, yourself repeating it many times so we're going to have to be efficient and effective with that. And just to kind of follow on from that, I think we, we do need to, there'll be the kind of general um, faculty level training for our GTAs, but we do need to think carefully. I do quite a lot of this myself in my, my, my teaching is, you know, making sure that our, our GTAs have the right skills and have the right knowledge about the exercises to be able to, to do that effectively is going to be a key thing for us to think about within our units. Yeah, and on that point, I think some of our disciplines are well versed in using GTAs in that sort of supporting role for what we will now think of as the synchronous activity, you know, for running small group example classes. And I think there's going to be other disciplines for whom it's quite new. They used to, you know, the member of academic staff tends to run them. And I think we're going to have to start giving heads of department an early sight of what those requirements may be, because it could be an increase in the GTA budget in particular disciplines. Scan through the next question. 
yeah, there's been a couple of suggestions here of alternative platforms for hosting material. At the moment, as I say, the university is very wedded to the idea that Blackboard is the platform. Um, we it's certainly I'll feed the comments forward to Ian Hurt as head of digital because uh, I think they are looking at alternatives but certainly for the coming semester probably the coming year I think we will be trying to live as much as we can within Blackboard doesn't mean I think that other platforms can't be explored but I think the official university position is Blackboard is our platform for delivery but some good suggestions there, and I'll pass those on to uh, Ian so we've got some questions around timetabling, Peter. So uh, Paul has asked, is the shape of the timetable going to change to reflect asynchronous aspects? And, and uh, Amir has asked, how would timetabling time work for synchronous activities uh, to make sure there are parallel sessions for different units of the same cohort? Do you want to, shall we? Yeah. Up? So we were given a very tight deadline by which to return timetables. I think it was the 12th of June. and which seemed a bit silly to me in the sense that I don't think many of us have got a head round what it is we wanted to timetable. So the faculty pretty well submitted a timetable that looked very traditional as if we just, you know, it was a standard 2020, 21 year. Um, estates are now trying to deliver that through socially distant spaces, which I think, let's be honest, even the back of the envelope will tell you very quickly, is probably not gonna succeed just on the reduced capacities. So um, Steve Pettifer and I met with the timetabling team last week and what we've said is that we're going to need to, within a matter of the next month, actually have a much better cut of what we all think we need to deliver blended learning. So um, there's some useful notes gone out on the wiki as to what a typical unit may look like and what the sort of expectations are in terms of synchronous and asynchronous per week. So we're going to use that and then get feedback from you when you actually start to create these units as to what actually is needed to be timetabled. There's two parts to this. There are spaces you may want physically on campus, which as I say, I think will be a challenge, but that needs to be in there. But there's the synchronous activities that you just need to appear on a student timetable, even though they may be delivered electronically. So we're not going to start that capture for several weeks yet because we don't think people know the answer to the question because they haven't yet fully thought through what blended would look like. The other part of that is we're going to need to timetable labs. As I say, they'll be a quite scarce resource and we're going to need to work out when they land. And as I say, that needs individual disciplines to tell us what the priorities are. So anticipate that call for information is about a month away and then we'll have to re-spin the timetable again. Oh, other thing to say on that, by the way, I think, and again, some good student feedback said uh, they quite like the structure that a timetable brings, you know, what you're doing and when in a week. And these are some, you know, quite switched on students said they, they did worry that if you don't have someone, should we say, almost at timetabling with you when you do the asynchronous bits, they may not do them when they need to, and then the synchronous bits lose value. So I think this could be very much one for academic advisors to support their advisees on building a weekly timetable and us having in the back of our mind a credible timetable that would show students when it really is sensible to do the asynchronous work. Scanning down questions. Matt Roy asking, is there a template or aspirational model for a virtual lab? Not that I know of. Um, I know quite a few colleagues are working on them, but I've not actually seen a template. I'm very happy if people have got expertise in this space or have already created them and want to share, please just send them through to, to Andy and myself. Be very happy to put some examples up there if people have got this material. Yeah. As I was saying, I believe we actually have some people who are quite well versed in doing this either through DL or just through interest anyway. Um, so I've got a question here, Peter, probably a good one for you. Uh, so um, from BMO, I guess, are the examinations in January 2021 or should all semester one units be 100% summative assessment? Okay, so 
the university has said that the examinations in the semester one exam period will be online. So has made that statement. At the bottom of the same message, there is a note about except where professional body requ requirements may differ. So uh, through the teaching committee and uh, Gregory Lenser through his role on Senate, we've put a paper into TLG exec, which is the top teaching committee in the university, uh, seeking permission to run invigilated exams where needed for professional body requirements, or because you just need a very high confidence level in the outcome of the exam. Um, and they could be run anywhere during the teaching period of semester one or in the exam period. That paper goes in on Wednesday, so I don't know the answer to it yet, but we're not alone. For example, the medics are in a similar position. Their professional body does require particular topics to be examined in or assessed in an invigilated manner. So we'll know a little bit more on that in about a week or two's time. What I would say is, being as we don't quite know the way COVID will play out, I think we'd all be very wise not to stack up a one hit assessment that has got to try and land in a traditional examination period. It, puts a, it makes it a very high stakes thing, particularly if you were assuming that you know, it's got to be fully invigilated or proctored. So I'm certainly from my own unit now, I'm looking at ways in which I could do summative assessments throughout the teaching delivery period and reduce the size of the last thing I would want to do in the traditional exam period. So I think the options here, Andy, to have a bit of a rethink about assessment as well. But as I say, in a couple of weeks, certainly better say a little bit more about invigilated assessments. And what we're looking at there is on campus or proctoring systems. And I'm under no illusion, by the way, that remote proctoring is not itself without problems. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, good. Some lots of questions coming in. Uh, let's have a look at the next one. Um, from Simon Harper. So question, as most of our students are from GMT plus, i.e. China, are we trying to rebalance the timetable to work for, say, eight till four in case people still in China uh, say? So I, I guess this, I'm not sure I've quite answered the question, but I think that the, 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 the thrust of the question was, do we need to think about our timetable and for it to be suitable for students who are studying online in China? I, I yes, guess. so, sorry, Andy. Oh, please, please, Peter. Now, this one came up as well because originally someone had the idea, which was that I may want to get up at three o'clock in the morning to deliver one of my synchronous sessions to a different time zone. So we're absolutely trying to avoid any kind of delivery by us that puts people here at some awkward position of having to deliver way outside core hours. So we're looking at reserving the early morning slots, nine till 10, uh, and the late afternoon slots, maybe five till six, if we need to be, if we have to double deliver to hit time zones. It would be nice to think that we could just be a bit smarter about this generally, uh, but yes, we're not, we're looking for methods that don't require colleagues to work outside core hours. But yeah, time zones are an issue. Same with assessment, trying to have a single assessment time with a very limited time window just isn't, well, our students were very good this year and quite a few of them did to get it up in the middle of the night to do some assessments, but we don't want that to be the norm. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, that leads us into our another question. So let's have a look. Well, actually I'll do, I'll do Patrick's first because it's a little bit further at the feed. Apologies if I've missed anybody's questions. Um, so Patrick Gadecki, several colleagues have reported that Blackboard Collaborate is often unstable and unpredictable when using online learning. I myself has also found it so. Hence, I delivered my lectures using Zoom, which is reliable. Given that this meeting is being held via Zoom, doesn't this say something about our confidence in Blackboard? Um, I think it does, but it's in Blackboard Collaborate, which is not actually a Blackboard. It's, not, it's a bolt into Blackboard. I believe we're doing, having some negotiations with Collaborate at the moment around quality of service. I'm not part of them, so I don't know which way that's going. But yes, Collaborate at times did struggle. Yeah, Patrick, acknowledge that. Um, let's have a look. Um, here we go, one from Akilu. 
So how will the invigilated exam work for students that are unable to travel to Manchester? Will it take the form of those done at, say, uh, British Council Centres for distance learning modules? So we, there's two things to look at here. One is, can, can we use these sort of remote examination centres? The answer is yes. I think colleagues who've been using them for distance learning, someone like James Brooks, you know, reported that it was far from trivial to set them up and get them to run. So I don't think we should assume it's an easy solution. The other thing I think the university may look at is remote proctoring. Um, and if anyone's come across this or even been involved in it, you'll know that it comes with all sorts of problems. It's quite an invasive process in terms of the person's PC being controlled, video monitoring. Students don't always find it the easiest thing, but it is being looked at. A number of our competitors are using remote proctoring as a way of delivering an invigilated experience overseas. Certainly something we want to minimise, I would have thought, given the challenges. Also, just to recognise, can be quite challenging for students with additional support needs. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the questions are being answered by other colleagues as we go. Oh, <laughs> which is great. I was just having a scan through. Um, Uh, social distance to one meter. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question that Oliver's asked about uh, labs. If social distancing drops to one meter, yes, you can sort of run small groups. Yes, you can run larger capacity. We've also got to factor into this uh, cleaning of spaces. Um, and that's non-trivial at times to work on actually how you clean it between groups. Um, Personally, I think dropping from two metres to one metre may not give us the obvious benefits because it's actually quite tricky to maintain one metre social distancing. It's bizarrely, I think, as someone said the other day, almost harder than two metres. So, and also it'll depend, I think, on how students react to it and how comfortable they feel operating in those spaces like that. So I'm yet to be convinced myself it's going to give us this huge benefit that it appears to, dropping to one metre in labs. We're currently resize all our labs to work out what they can do in one meter or in two meters uh, and also factoring in the cleaning time as well uh, because that actually was dominating the timetable the time taken to clean uh, absolutely that um the interesting point yeah about peter cross about labs in the evening uh if we can staff them the answer is you could certainly run labs in the evening but there is a well-being issue here about getting people safely to and from campus once you go outside core hours, Peter. The Students' Union has been quite concerned uh, and it's said about how people would safely move across parts of Manchester if you went outside the core hours. Yeah. So I think something we need to think about. Not impossible, but we need to think about it. Maybe I, maybe I could ask if, if, if there are questions that we, we haven't we've missed and we haven't answered yet if you just want to if you could copy and paste them back into the into the chat that would be really uh, useful or if, if there's other questions it's all good stuff as they're keeping up with it the hard um, Here we go, got a new one, come in. So from Lev, um, it would be also useful to summarize the discussion we had so far, the questions and, and the answers. So so thanks Lev, yeah, uh, we can we can see how we, we deal with that and, and summarize those. And, and I think we've got a wiki, haven't we, which is FAQs, Peter? Yeah, so um, we're using the wiki every, so every time we do one of these um, blended learning question times on a Thursday afternoon, we're capturing the, the chat space and somebody's going through transcribing verbal answers. So the wiki then at least acts as a central repository for all of that. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Lev. Um, oh, here we go, another one from, from Yuli, Peter. So, uh, oh, something that we overlooked. So can we have a license for transcribing audio like Otter AI? in particular for people with hearing difficulties. I 
think that was picked up with that what the activities that that Niels is looking at our other associate dean around transcription which are particularly challenging for more mathematical subjects isn't it so that's a, a, an area of ongoing activity um peter do you want to add anything to that no i think that's a good suggestion let's yeah leave that with us Sully. We'll, we'll feed that one in actually i know Niels had picked up on um he had a couple of people contact him about uh, people with hearing difficulties and how they'd cope so yeah okay that, that, that's really good to hear and so even if it's not perfect so things like otter.ai they they can learn over time that they learn the technical terms and adapt to your voice and so I've, I've had some recent experiences and i was super impressed with it and i think it would make a huge difference that's lovely. I mean, I'm sure Niels wouldn't mind me saying it. Niels judges himself to be the test. If he can actually make anything, as he said, out of what he's saying in his, with his Dutch accent, as he puts it. Um, no, it's a good suggestion. Uh, we will forward that one on to him. That's good. So there's one from, from Duncan, Peter. So will the university mandate copyright University of Manchester for all videos produced or are there other licenses allowed were most appropriate, more appropriate? Yeah, it's a good one this time, but I asked this question the other day because I'd noticed some of the templates coming out had no copyright information on them at all. Um, I've actually gone back to the library and asked them if we want to actually have a sort of a policy statement, well policy is too grand, a statement around this because I think there is a mixture of things here because I know some colleagues want to share material from Manchester with other universities with a reciprocal agreement of material coming back to us. And so I think there are other license types that would work much better. Um, but yeah, I think we need to do, we need to think about it because there's certainly material that we wouldn't just want to put out there without a copyright. Okay. Well, Sarah, yeah, the, oops, Kate wanted the link to the wiki. Yeah, we'll do that, Kate. I just need to check because at the moment the link I've got is probably not a, not one to the, the specific wiki. So. If you're happy, let us sort that out and then we'll circulate that wiki link out. Yeah, so I think Andrew Hall putting the last edits in from the last blended learning session. Yeah, but we will get that out. Uh, good, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, yep, I'll try AI, good. Andrew. Yeah, the, the software we've mentioned, certainly around video editing, we're going to pull all of those recommendations and links together, aren't we, Andy? I think you're already getting that material together, so you'll literally be able to go to the Teaching Academy site and find links, the software that we're suggesting you use, and links to it. And just to reinforce the point, we're not saying you have to use it. The, you know, there's colleagues on this call that I'm sure are very much more adept at using this than I am. And we'll have their own favorites and that's great yeah but it's for colleagues who've never used it before or this you know and just saying what's the recommendation these are all things that you can use and most importantly e-learning will be there to support you so e-learning can't support all packages so we focused our stand on the few so that we've got guaranteed ways to record video and edit video i think there's a a, a really good question that's come from uh, Oli, as well about um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds and access to hardware. Um, maybe I'll just say quickly and you can add to it or, or correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. Um, so the, the university has been um, fortunate to have received uh, over a million pounds from um, of donations to support students from disadvantaged backgrounds. So there's already quite a significant program of activity about providing hardware for those students that most need it which I think is, is, is fantastic. Um, but I do think it is something that we need to be on the ball about and, and reviewing. Um, so yeah, I agree with you completely. This is something that we want to make sure that all our students can engage with the materials and aren't disadvantaged in any way. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it, I think it was impressive. It was six weeks from the launch of that funding initiative to they had a million pounds to support those students, which was lovely to see. Um, Oh, so there's one from Kate Smith around uh, um, starting titles and logos for Manchester University um, for videos and things. Um, it, it, maybe you could reply or, 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 or use your microphone, Kate, please feel free. Um, we, we can supply those um, if, if that's something that colleagues would like. 
one of the things that I picked up on creating these weekly videos with Steve Pettifer and e-learning and stuff is you can you can end up in a bit of a situation. I, I, I teach uh, LabVIEW in, with National Instruments and they, uh, to supplement my course, they have lots of little short videos which I point students to and say, hey, you know, you want to hear it a different way, go and look at these links. And you can, you can quickly become quite annoying with that when every video starts, hi, my name's Vineet. And, and if every video, if the students are watching them back to back and it's the same bit or the same logo, that can get quite frustrating. So uh, I think that's for colleagues to decide what's what's appropriate. But but if you think that's of use, Kate, please just reply in the chat and, and I'll, I'll get, the, get those links circulated. Yeah, we will get back to around licenses because I think it is something that came up last week about what licenses can we use? Um, and as Peter Hollingworth observes, it's a non-trivial area to, to wade into over who owns copyright, what licenses can be used. So way outside my experience, but I know it's being discussed. So let us come back to you with an answer on that. I think one of the university governance groups is looking at that. Great. I see there's something recommended from Akilu. Um, so he's, he's found something from a Tasmanian university. Th thanks for that, Akilu. Um, uh, we'll, we'll go and have a look at that. If, if other colleagues have seen other things at other universities or know of good practice, please feel free to email me directly and, and send those in to me. Or, you know, we've got some excellent um, teaching and learning enhancement leads, some of which I can see in, in all of our disciplines, some of which I can see on the, on the call today. Please do, you know, forward these things and let's share that information that would be great yeah no, please do because we as i say we're not claiming that we know all the best things in all of these spaces largely it's informed by people such as yourselves sending links in and then following them up oh thanks for that sean yes i noticed the word challenge is in that url which is probably the good word to have if it's got licensing anywhere near it um, Good, thank you for that. We're almost to time, aren't we? So what we'll do off the back of this is we will capture everything that's come through the chat, then feed this into the, the wiki that's uh, growing rapidly. So at least then we have a single searchable place you can look for answers to questions. So I think as we go through these uh, sessions and the Thursday ones, we're gonna have a fairly rich source of data and recommendations. And it may be Andy, we want to have a separate one that literally just makes recommendations uh, for things for people to go and look at as resources or good practice actually. Yes, absolutely. Great. So if I can save all this chat now. There you go. Yeah, before we close out. Okay. Oh, good. But no, thank you very much. It's been very useful. Because it, it's useful to us actually, because we understand now the, the questions that are very much on your mind. At least if we can ask, answer some of them, I'm pleased. Okay. Good. That great. Okay. Right. Well, you got the chat, have you, Andy? I think I've got that. Yeah. So. Great. Good. Thank you very much indeed. So yeah, I guess that con concludes our our meeting today. Um, thank you very much to everybody for attending and, and listening to me waffle on for a little while and, and asking some great questions. Um, yeah, Blender's question time on Thursday again, if there's some other questions which come up uh, between now and then, look forward to, to speaking to you then, but if, but if not, please enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.